You may remember that in the Obama administration, very early on, the women in the group had felt that Obama was attributing to the men in the room things that the women had said. And what did they do for their solution? It's hard to tell a hip president that he's biased. So they decided, outside of the meetings, that whenever one of them would speak, they would say, when Susan, as Susan said earlier, or as, as, and Obama being the smart man he is, said, are you guys trying to tell me something here? This is Sachin. And this is Eric. Welcome to Luminary, kitchen table style conversations with some of the world's brightest minds exploring boundaries of human knowledge. Join us on a pursuit to transmit intuition and ideas. Find us at luminary.fm or on Twitter at luminaryfm. We'd love to hear from you. Today's guest is Mazarin Banaji, an award-winning experimental psychologist and professor at the Department of Psychology at Harvard University. Her research explores the human mind, why and how we think and feel in certain ways, especially in social context, and frameworks for better identifying and addressing implicit human biases. She is the co-creator of the Implicit Association Test, which has been used over 40 million times. In this episode, we cover how human beings think and the nature of subconscious human biases, Mazarin's book, Blind Spot, Hidden Biases of Good People, Project Implicit, and her many other initiatives seeking to address implicit cognitive biases. We also discuss the impact of technology on psychology research and how social media may influence human biases. Tell us about your childhood and your journey into academia. So I was raised in the Twin Cities of Sikandrabad and Hyderabad in South India. I was born to Zoroastrian parents. These are people who your listeners will not have heard of, except that if you read Nietzsche, you'll know the name Zarathustra. So these are people who practiced a religion in Persia up until the 8th century or so after which Islamic invasions of Persia led to mass conversions from Zoroastrianism to Islam. So my ancestors would have been part of a small group of people who left Iran in the 9th and into the 10th centuries, the large migration, and they traveled east looking for any country that would allow them religious asylum. They were willing to adapt to everything else, but they wished to practice their religion. The first country that offered this group of people asylum was a king in Gujarat. And so the Parsis have been in India since the ninth century. What is interesting about India to me is that it allowed my people to come, to be safe, to practice their religion freely, and to actually get integrated in the community in Gujarat well enough that they could prosper and be safe, but not by removing from them their cultural identity, which even today, after 11 centuries, is still intact. So the Parsis have not become Gujarati. Like sometimes we're asked, are you really Indian? And I think only in India can you live for 11 centuries and people will ask you, are you really Indian? <laughs> But that's sort of the background. And I mention it only because this group now numbers about 80,000 in the world. Soon it will become a tribe because it is not a very smart culture in terms of continuity or just, you know, survival. It's a patrilineal culture. It's, you know, children cannot be Zoroastrian unless they're of a Zoroastrian father. They don't accept any conversion, like zero. The birth rate is much lower than the death rate. My own family has contributed to it. I, my sister, and my brother, all three of us have no children. <laughs> you know, it's an unusual community. But they did very well in business. And my ancestors, I've learned, were owners of ships, and they did a lot of trading. And the money they got, they decided to keep a little for themselves and give away 
large amounts of to what they regarded to be important enterprises in India, hospitals, schools, housing, things like that. And I believe, I don't know, people like to say that we are a generous people, but I'm a scientist and I think that much more likely we did that so that we would be safe. So, but over time you start to develop an identity that you are a generous people and maybe then you become generous. That was my life and I mention it because it's highly unique in India, but also very unique in the world today. I lived in a community of Zoroastrians. There was a compound around a temple and there were a few flats in there for people who are Zoroastrian. And so I grew up in a very interesting, maybe even strange kind of life where within the confines of the compound, we were all Zoroastrian and played with each other. And the compound was big enough that we could, you know, play cricket, climb trees, walk in a stream, collect lots and lots of tamarind from tamarind trees. Mm -hmm. We had geese and dogs and cats and all of that in our little compound. You stepped out and then we were in a very foreign world, the world of Hyderabad and Sikandrabad. So my mother was a teacher and she and her sister created a school. Space being what it was, they each took the verandas of their apartments and they turned those verandas into schools. And that school eventually became very successful. But when it was first started in, I think, 64, I think I and a boy were the first students in it. The, the reason I tell you this is because I um, was what in India they called a sick child. I had a bunch of autoimmune illnesses. I had very bad asthma. And in those days, people didn't think about preventing illnesses like this. They just went from one religious person to another looking for a cure for asthma. And so I can tell you, in another podcast, I can tell you some pretty fantastic stories of all the different religious groups that have prayed for me, Baptists who've laid hands on me, Muslim Babas who've brushed me with peacock feathers, Hindu fish merchants who've put live fish down my throat and tied a black thread in my ear in the hope that I would be cured. These may sound fantastical to you, but that was life. The good thing about being a sick child was that I didn't go to school much. So I got very smart because I could read everything I wanted. And my mother did a pretty good job of making sure that I got homework to do at home. But she invited me to come teach children who were about a year younger than me in her little school. So I'd be five years old. She'd give me a four-year-old and say, you got to teach them how to write the alphabet. Because in India, you start learning to write and read much earlier than you do in the United States. I was already writing letters and reading pretty fluently for a four-year-old, of course. But a three-year-old didn't know anything at all. So when people ask me about my teaching, And I often say that if you think I'm a decent teacher, it's because I've been practicing since I was four or five. I've had a pupil assigned to me when I was that age. What is psychology and how does your work relate to psychology? Psychology is nothing more than the study of the human mind. Just like there are psychologists who look at, is the 30-watt bulb represented in our minds as twice as bright as the 15-watt bulb? I'm interested in what are the rules that you're using when you're making decisions about uh, the competence of somebody. So there are many areas of psychology. There's cognitive psychology, is interested in memory. But attention, the study of how we attend to information, the study of how we perceive information in the world from reality, what's the distance from reality? the study of human memory, the study of learning. How do we learn? How do we update past learning? Are we good Bayesians in in some way? And how do we actually use our priors? Somebody like Kahneman and Tversky, whose names you may have heard, created a whole area showing that people like you and I make very many stupid decisions every single day, that your sense of the worth of even a product in a domain you're an expert on. So let's pick something that has to do with computers or computing and you want to buy something. It turns out if I make you think of a random number that's small, you'll think that object, that next object, which has no relationship to the number because the number is the last two digits of your social security number, let's say, 
you'll say you'll be willing to pay a price that's lower than if your social security number was 90. So if it's closer to 10, you'll think that that trackball or keyboard is worth eight bucks or 26 bucks. So these are the kinds of things that psychologists do. And so I'm smack in the middle, very mainstream, except that we're applying it now to decisions about groups of people and about individuals and not about money or numbers or whatever it might be. Yeah, so it's absolutely like in the center of psychology, of social psychology. And is that how you differentiate social psychology from psychology? Let's just get into maybe just how I would define the research area. And that'll give you, I think, everything you're looking for on where I sit in the larger group. I tend not to identify at the smallest level, social psychology, or within that even there are lots of subfields. I just identify as an experimental psychologist. And I use the word experimental to simply differentiate me from the many, many, many people who call themselves psychologists, but who are therapists. So that's the big divide, of course, that if you're a research scientist or an experimental psychologist, you're doing your work in a way that's more similar to what a biologist or a neuroscientist might do. People who are experimental psychologists, which is, I would say, sort of my tribe, it would be fair to say that such a person is inherently interested in hidden phenomena, because, you know, we can't see or smell or touch the mind, right? Mind scientists like myself, we have to be comfortable, on the one hand, dealing with inferences that we must draw about something that is completely invisible to us. So this sets us apart from many other scientists who, at least in the classical work in those fields, work on a thing that is with powerful tools and so on, but that can at least be seen now and then an electron, or a cell, or a chemical process. But we can't do that. And so I would say that it takes a certain kind of fearlessness to do what we do when we say, I'm interested in studying how the mind works. But at the same time, because we can so easily go wrong, we can so easily draw weak inferences from the data that we need to build very high standards internally for ourselves as to what's acceptable evidence. And I would say that is, in a way, how experimental psychologists in general would operate. But my area of interest, I think, is best described by a three-word term that my colleague and I created in the early 1990s. And that term is implicit social cognition. So let's just start with cognition. That's easy. I'm interested in how human beings think and how they feel. I study the concepts like knowledge and facts, things like beliefs we might hold. Is the earth flat or round? Do vaccines you know, cause autism? Things like that. But most interestingly to me, I've studied most deeply something that we might call attitudes or preferences. These are likes and dislikes that we have for which there is no right or wrong answer. It's just a set of values that we have for which there need be no reason. So I can say, I don't know why, but I like blue better than red. That's an attitude, that's a preference. I can even go all the way up the scale to a kind of a moral attitude and say, I believe it's really important to treat people fairly. So preferences, these are really interesting things because imagine an attitude that I have a value that it's important to treat people fairly. Okay, now that is also something that is not based in fact, it's not knowledge based, but it is a very strong preference. And that's what I've been studying. So that explains two of those words, right? Implicit social cognition, let's just break it down. You know what cognition is, it's studying how humans or any other species thinks and how it might feel certain things. So the emotion component is is important to us. The second word uh, that that I wanna explain is the word implicit. And we did that earlier, but it refers to sort of an abiding interest in aspects of our minds of which we're not aware. So I would say that I have been just fascinated by attitudes and beliefs that we cannot report on when we have to reach into our minds and pull them out and say, how do you feel? We can do that. I can ask you, or you can ask me. And I would say, I love the Red Sox. 
I do not love the Yankees. Okay, I can tell you that. I'll tell it publicly. And my t-shirts will reveal my preference. But I'm much more interested in not asking people that kind of question because we won't get into this today, but there are a whole lot of constraints that exist when you have to rely on people's self-report. A simple example would be if I want to admit a student, I would not just say to them, tell me, how smart are you? That self-report is worthless to me because it would come with lots of biases in it. So I now have to find some indirect method of estimating how smart they are. And I'm interested in finding out what are people's attitudes that they may not even know they have. Not even that they're lying about them. Sometimes people lie about their attitudes. There are lots of studies that show that, you know, many more people voted for Richard Nixon than later said had voted for Nixon after he had been impeached. And it's not always clear whether they're lying. It may be that they actually forgot who they voted for because over time Nixon became such a despised figure. But we cannot rely only on self-report for lots of interesting things. And I would say if there's something unique about this type of work we did, it was to build tools, to build a method, to build a technique, much like a biologist or a chemist or a physicist would have to do to reach the phenomenon they're interested in studying. And Uh, I was just lucky that I collaborated with Tony Greenwald and the IAT or the Implicit Association Test emerged as a very strong contender and I would say the dominant method today for studying implicit social cognition. And the social part for me in some ways is that that's the middle word and I can't do justice to it because it's such a big area. But We're not interested in attitudes like, how do you feel about the weather in Boston? That would be a perfectly good attitude that somebody could study, but not us. We have been interested in attitudes towards social groups. And groups are just very interesting because they're composed of individuals. We have to make decisions often about individuals. And the question is, can we take the group into account to the extent we should? And do we not take the group into account to the extent we should not be using the group as an indicator? You mentioned about biases. Why do these biases exist? Right. So they exist because your ancestors and mine did not have the goal of running a corporation or getting everything right or making money. Our ancestors, our brains evolved in people whose main objective was to survive to the end of the day. In a world like that, it's totally okay to look at somebody and say, he's tall, he can reach that tree, Let's, he must be really great. What our brains don't realize is that we're now using it when we make decisions about who should be an American president, where the tallness of the person has no bearing on how well they can do their job, and yet the data showed that I think in all American presidential elections but one, the taller of the two candidates has always won. But this is not basketball. It's the presidency. (laughs) Clearly, we don't have the brightest light bulbs running the country if we rely on these irrational dimensions like height. But they're there for a reason. It's just that that reason is no longer good. And it's still being used. So one of the things I will say, though, is that the first step is for, for us to even know that a bias exists. That's not so trivial. Because if I use the height of a person to vote for them, but I don't know I'm using their height, and I think I'm paying attention to their competence, then we're in real trouble. Just identifying that a bias even is operating is the first step. And then, of course, there is a whole lot more to be done about how do you make people aware so that they don't become defensive, so that they realize that this might be in their interest. And when I mentioned that I've been speaking to groups outside of academia, it's mostly to teach people that they need not worry about these issues from any moral standpoint of, I must be a fair person, I must treat everybody equally. Just think about it from the perspective of, is this good for you? Is this good for your business? How does one begin to address these biases? It's like any major problem that the planet faces. So I would ask the same question, or you would ask the same question to somebody 
who's thinking about climate change. Because climate change is very similar to what I study. Something is happening. We can measure it. And the measurements tell us what is happening. And the measurements tell us how severe the problem is. I feel I'm measuring and I can see how severe the problem is. It's very pervasive. It's in every culture, in every human, and so on. But what to do about climate change is a non-trivial question. We can't agree on what to do, but we know that individuals in every society have to do something. I have to recycle. I have to think about a hybrid car or an electric car, so those are my personal choices. But I can't do that if my city does not provide me with a recycling bin or if people aren't manufacturing electric cars. And they may not be doing that because there's no subsidy for it, even though there might be lots of subsidies for corn growing. What do you do about this is exactly what you would do when you confront a very major problem that sweeps across the world, whether it is poverty, whether it's climate change. We must think about the solutions as being both at the level of the individual, and I'm a psychologist, so I know more about that, but we cannot leave it just to the individual. We have to have institutions and governments, countries begin to be involved in holding hands to come up with protections. Because if you tell me, don't be biased, that's not going to help me very much. You're going to have to figure out a strategy. So a simple example could be that if the height of a person matters, maybe when I'm hiring, I shouldn't see them. Maybe I just shouldn't. There are lots of interesting data, right, on symphony orchestras that when you see the musician playing, you select in a certain way. But if you put a curtain in front of the musician so that you cannot see them, you can only hear them, then many more women, for example, are selected, which tells us that there are very many good women who are auditioning. They're just not getting the job. And obviously, as soon as you put who it is, you are selecting differently. That brings us to outsmarting human minds because I don't believe we can get rid of our biases overnight any more than we can fix climate change this year. But we can be moving on that path and we can be moving either aggressively or, or not. It all depends on our will to do that. We can say that teachers should not know the name of the student when they grade or that we should do our interviews much later in the process because you need to develop a much better way of getting deep data from about a person on the resume, not the resume you currently get, but a real resume that has actual knowledge on what they did and how they did it, and maybe bringing them in as interns and watching what they do over the course of a year before you make a hire. These are protections that we can build in so that we may not make the mistake or that we will make the mistake, but the process will keep us from making the mistake, like the symphony orchestras did with blind auditioning. When it comes to addressing bias, how does Project Implicit help further this cause? So I see it less as a cause and more as an education. Okay. Um, so if you have a tumor in your head, I would think that somebody like you or I would want to know about it. But what if it is silent for a long, long time? We would want to device techniques like CAT scans or MRIs or whatever to be able to see them. We think that's better than not using those techniques. I think the IAT and the measures we are developing in psychology are very similar. We think there's something in our minds of which we're unaware. It doesn't express itself to us and says, hey, I'm a bias. I'm about to make you do something really bad or wrong. Since that doesn't happen, we need to develop these methods to get at that. And our work is at a very baby level, right? Because I often think that these methods will someday be seen as, you know, the very first experiments in physics or the very first experiments in astronomy, where we took pieces of glass and we said, turn them in this orientation and suddenly you can see forever. And oh my God, from that comes an earth shattering, literally, idea. So I think that we're a long, long way from being able to do anything like many of the older sciences do, but we are entering the playing field at a time when technology is massively different than it would have been in Galileo's time or 
Archimedes' time. And so we can make progress a lot faster. So I would just say that the site, implicit.harvard.edu, is, is the URL. And if somebody goes there, they can actually take a test that will not require them to say how they feel or think or what they believe about themselves, but instead will put them through a five-minute experience of having to pair things together rapidly. And from those data, we can deduce a few things. We can say, Mazarin, in your mind, male and career is much more closely associated than female and career. And I can say, huh? How can that be? I'm a woman. I've always had a career. My mother had a career. Why do I not associate the two equally? And the test tells us that our brains contain the thumbprint of the culture. That it's not just what I think or want to think, but what my mental systems are absorbing from what they see every day in the world. And it's not even a fully accurate view of that, because as you can imagine, what I see may be different from what somebody else in Russia might see, where women are doctors or whatever. So, so these are the variations that the test might pick up. So I think we recognize that human beings carry implicit biases more concretely, do you have any mental models or checklists around how to actually rein in these implicit biases? That's what Outsmarting Human Minds was sort of built for. So it was built with two things in mind. The first idea for Outsmarting Human Minds was that if governments and nonprofit organizations and for-profit organizations are teaching about implicit bias, we should worry a little bit about the quality of the teaching. But who are the experts? You know, there's, there people read something and then they say, I'm an expert on implicit bias and they can teach it to you in whatever way they want. We're academics. So we don't want to run a business where that's what we would do, but it is many billions of dollars worth of money for people who do do this. And I don't believe that we can teach people how to do this, how to change, unless we can actually show them what the problem is. And that's really non-trivial. I can show you a bias that you might have, you might agree. And then in another instance, slightly different, you may not recognize it. As I said earlier, there are two ways to proceed. The Outsmarting Human Minds Project was developed to actually give people like you all a snapshot of what the bias is and then what you might do to protect yourself from having that bias. Now, those are not written stone. There's not huge amounts of scientific evidence that method A works better than method B. We're still just developing what the solutions are. But I gave you one just a minute ago. Physical appearances really have strong impact on our selection. We are not selecting the smartest people. If they have a squint, we may not select them. Uh, if because they just didn't look at us in the same direct way that we are comfortable with or something. Once you know that, you can build in ways of protecting against that. So symphony orchestras can do blind auditioning. We cannot do that in your jobs and mine. I have to know how somebody teaches. So I've got to take into account a whole variety of things. But I might find ways to make sure that I have read the work long before I ever meet them. There are many things like that that can be done. The CEOs of major corporations have come up with very interesting solutions. Uh, When they're doing something like succession planning, who should be the next CEO of this great American institution? Well, you can do it the usual way. What's the usual way? You get a consultancy to advise you. You go off on retreats and you eat high fat food for three days in some nice location uh, and you talk. Would so-and-so be good? Do we need this type of skill now? This is 20 years since the old CEO left, so started. So now we need a different kind of person. We do due diligence, but we're doing due diligence through the lenses that are biased. They have to be. So a very smart CEO actually did something. He took the top 50 senior people in his company who he knew, and that's the pool from which the next person, the next leader is going to come. He was retiring as CEO. And he created blind biographies of these folks. And he handed those out to the selectors and he said, you know, tell me, who who do you think looks like a good potential candidate? Just tell me by reading their skills, experience, et cetera. And he pulled out of the set the 10 people who got the highest scores. Let's just call that the blind group. 
And then he did the retreat where they talked and talked and talked. Again, the same people talked about, you know, 50 possible people. And then they pulled out the 10 people from there who came out on top. And the reason he called me to talk to me about this was that he said, I'm just stunned, he said, because the 10 who came up as top, at the top of the, the heap in the blind group are mutually exclusive from the ones who came up when we knew who they were. Now, this to me is a very smart CEO. I think this group was given a very direct experience with a potential bias, and he did it creatively. And now I believe that that group will choose better. Why? Because you just showed them that individual A appeared on this list, but not on your other list. Why? What is it about that? So I think we are smart enough when we can sit down and think and be shown our bias that we will want to protect ourselves because we do intend to do right. Okay. Another CEO told me that he had been, this is another example of what both of you are asking, which is what can one do? I had done a demonstration with his group that had shown him that he missed seeing something he should never have missed. And everybody in the room misses it. And it's kind of a shocking moment when this happens. And people are just stunned because I show it to them again. And they go, how could I not have seen that? Okay, so, so that's the experience. And he took that and said, you know, I've been told that when women on my board make interesting comments about the future of our business, that I apparently don't hear it. But when somebody who's six feet, four inches tall says the same thing, I write it down and say, oh, that's a great idea. We should think about that. And he said, I've never believed that because I, I don't do that. I listen to every voice, but I've been told that, he said. So I was in some doubt, but I really believed that that was their bias, not mine. And he said, but after you showed me how I missed something because my expectation was for something different, now I can see that this is exactly what's going on in my board, possibly, at least possibly. And what did he do? He didn't just stop there he created a solution. He called me up a few months later to say, I've fixed my bias. <laughs> and I said, well, what did you do? And he said, I just couldn't stop thinking about it. So I thought, how, if, if, if the shape and form in which the voice, the accent, the volume, the register, if that to me, to my old brain, is giving a false signal, this is an important idea. This is not such an important idea. He said, what I now do is I have a picture of the board in front of me, simple, one piece of paper, a, a schematic of the oval table and all the people who are sitting around it. And he said, I now have a rule that if anybody opens their mouth for more than 15 seconds and says something, I write it down under their name. I just do that. I, in other words, he's saying I became a note taker. Now if I want to know who said what. I don't have to rely on my memory. I can accurately attribute the idea to the right person and I'm thinking about all contributions. And I thought that was a very smart idea. And some of you may remember that in the Obama administration, very early on, the women in the group had felt that Obama was attributing to the men in the room things that the women had said. And what did they do for their solution? It's hard to tell a hip president that he's biased. So they decided, outside of the meetings, that whenever one of them would speak, they would say, when Susan, as Susan said earlier, or as, as, and Obama being the smart man he is, said, are you guys trying to tell me something here? And figured out what that was, another kind of protection, right? So there are just lots and lots of, so most of the work right now is on change. How do we make change happen? And we could do like 10 podcasts on just the change data. Because we are finding, and this is maybe important to you to know, we published a paper earlier this year in Psychological Science that you are free to go look at, and it's on, are we changing in the country? Are we becoming less biased? And the data suggest that we are indeed becoming less biased on something like sexuality attitudes. So gay was bad and straight was good 10 years ago. It's still not good, but it is far less bad to be gay. That bias has changed so significantly that it's something like a 48% change in expressed attitudes and a 33% drop in implicit attitudes. That's unbelievable, unthinkable. I would never have predicted that. So the Washington Post recently, a couple of Fridays ago, did a story on that and why attitudes towards gay people might be changing. Race is changing too, but not nearly at the same rate. It's about a 15% change by comparison. 
So we can ask, what is it about sexuality attitudes that's allowing even conservatives, even elderly people, to be changing? Sure, they're not changing as fast as liberals and young people are, but they too are changing. They're becoming less biased, whether they want to or not. You know, on the implicit measures, when we see them change, we have no idea whether they actually really want to change or not, but that's what the culture does. The norms in the culture drive your own mind to change. And so I'm very excited about these data because A, it's just proof that change can happen. Now we have to figure out what are the drivers for certain kinds of change when it does happen? And then ask the question, why is it not changing for some of these others? And figure that out. And how is social media interacting with our psyches as a population? And let's maybe focus on the U.S. Is it perpetuating existing implicit biases? Is it making it better? So I think those studies have yet to be done. There are people who are now doing those studies. What they do is they create bots that have a certain personality, I guess. A bot can be described as being a 45-year-old white man, for example. And when that bot enters some chat and says, I thought what you said was sexist, I didn't like that, you can now measure and see how quickly do the sexist comments dwindle away. And would the same have happened if the bot were a 45-year-old woman who said the same thing? So social media is going to be the place where a lot of these experiments are going to be done. We're hoping to do some of them. But my hypothesis at present is that it amplifies everything. We talk a lot about what social media does that's bad, and there's no question that the echo chambers uh, and so on continue to keep wrong beliefs and they don't allow for corrections and so on. I remember watching a woman who was a Trump supporter saying, I was just really surprised when I heard that apparently Trump has told some lies. I didn't know that. Remember, I think from a neutral group is now 10,000 something, right? The total number of lies. Clearly, this is one example of what social media can do. That's not very good. But I think social media is also putting in front of us so many options and so many choices and so many fast ways of getting to the right answer that I have to believe that ultimately it will actually help, even though, like I said, it'll, it'll amplify both the good and the bad. What are the frontiers of future research in psychology? I can't tell you about psychology because it's an enormous field. <laughs> and I can tell you about this particular topic on yes. implicit cognition. And I can tell you that there's a strong interest in studying methods of changing people's minds, institutions' minds, so that they will believe better data over worse data and so on, and then how to bring about acceptance of the bias and then change. So that's one area of research. Another one that I am very interested in and have been pursuing for the last 15 years or so is research on young children. Where does it begin? How early do we see it in children? And the answers have been very shocking. It starts very, very, very early. So that's something that's worth, worth knowing. Machine learning. This is going to be very important because we can now use lots of language corpora or even just the common crawl and look at the associations between words like female and career, male and home in the language using algorithms that computer scientists have developed. And we have to be careful to look at <laughs> how good the algorithms themselves are. But to the extent that we're able to distinguish between better and worse ones, we've been using this method and we can analyze, for example, there are databases that contain 69,000 conversations between parents and children. And they're online. We can take that database and we can look to see for evidence of whether certain kinds of stereotypes are already in the language when parents and children talk to each other. Parents will say to us often, I don't know where my child is getting this from, but we certainly don't teach them this. So who, why, why, why are they saying these things? And you know, I would say to the parent, well, 
you know, you're not the only influence on your child. But now, when we analyze these data, we see that the stereotypes in how parents and children talk to each other are exactly the same as you find in adult-adult conversations, in TV shows for children and for adults, in books for children and for adults, and of course, in the Google data that people have been using. And an interesting study by a computer scientist at Princeton showed that the biases that the IAT picks up in individual people's minds who go to the website and take a test are nearly identical to what you would find if you took 69 whatever billion words in Google and looked at those exact same associations. So what is in our minds is clearly being spat out into the cyberverse and then that stuff gets fed back to us. So there are some very interesting biases that you all might think about. So you must have heard about what Google did. They tried, but the first thing they found is that languages, you know, they translate all the time. So some languages don't have gendered pronouns. So when you say in Turkish something like, oh, is a doctor, oh, is it, kind of, there's no male and female pronoun. It's just the letter O. O is a nurse. So in Turkish, it would be, it is a doctor or something like that. Person is a doctor, person is a nurse. When Google translated it into English, Google translated it as, he is a doctor, she is a nurse. And that makes sense from a machine's point of view. It's computing some base rate and saying, I'll pick the pronoun that is more frequent. But by doing that, and doing it over and over and over again, you can see that it's also perpetuating an association. And sometimes those are quite out of line with changes that are happening in the profession. And sometimes they reflect what is happening. So those are the kinds of very interesting questions we, we will be working on. You mentioned about machine learning playing a role in the research. Other than that, how has technology helped your research? Technology? My God, in everything. I'm one of those lucky people who arrived in graduate school, wrote my first paper on a typewriter. And then by the end of my first year in graduate school, I got one of the first small computers. This was 1980. And all I'll say is that nothing, nothing we've done would have been possible without technology of that kind. Then, of course, came the brain revolution. And so we did research with neuroscientists using fMRI to look at brain activations when you and I look at people's faces of different races and so on. So we were able to do that. Quite scary. The first studies, nobody wanted to do them because, as you can imagine, the fear of what we would find did play a role in who did the work, whether they did the work or not, whether journals accepted the papers or not. So that was a massive advance. And I think that the big data revolution will be yet another one. So nothing I do is, it's so intertwined with the technology that it's hard to say what the work is minus the technology. What's your process or framework to your research? I have two main jobs, do research and teach. Now, of course, I have lots of administrative work to do, but I don't count that as work. I feel like I'll do all that, chair of my department, or I'll serve on three university committees and five departmental committees and all of that. I mean, I do that. And I have to keep some check on whether work that is urgent is shoving out work that is important. There is no sort of a linear beginning and ending point for somebody who's been doing this for 40 years. So I have 40 years worth of stuff in my head. And then as a new fact or a new research result comes before me, I know the next question to ask is, does it do this? So then I look for a student who might be interested. And I have a lab of postdocs and graduate students and undergraduates and paid research assistants and so on. And so we meet as a lab. We talk about it, and once somebody decides they want to take ownership of that, then that person and I will meet. I see my students very often because we don't work in libraries. We have offices right next door to each other, and we're in every day, so we see each other every day. So there's some conversation going on all the time, as it might between you and your people that you manage. But I do have a formal hour-long meeting every week with every student, and that's a very big chunk. It's like two full days of the week. And those meetings are to see what progress they made on those every week. 
And then we meet as a group, as a lab, once a week, and somebody presents. It could be a new idea. Does this idea have legs? Is it worth pursuing? I'm running into trouble. I can't design the right experiment. You get feedback on that. Then you go do the first study. Then you say, it didn't work. Uh, what could have happened? That's wrong. You present it again to the lab, and it's this little iterative process. And we try to do this by putting everything we're thinking in some kind of open source framework so that people know what we thought was going to happen and then what actually happened so that we don't write our research papers. I haven't done that for a long time, long before open science. I just felt there was something odd about writing up the results as if you had already thought that's the result that should emerge. In our work, the method was so powerful and our minds were so weak at coming up with ideas that we would think A should happen and the data would show B happened or not A happened. And when that happens, you have to fess up and say, we thought this is what would happen. We thought that in regions of the country that were more diverse, attitudes towards Black Americans, Hispanic Americans would actually be more positive than areas of the country that are less diverse. No, that's not the case. Think about it. You know, you live in San Francisco, the likelihood that you all will have clear stereotypes of East Asians and South Asians is much greater than for somebody in Montana who never gets to see them. So you're both more at risk for showing bias, which we had never thought about, but you're also in a great position of being able to remove your bias because of where you live. You could have close friends. You could actually say, not all Asians are the same. All of those things that you would be able to do. I would just say that it's, the process is one of honest reporting of what we thought. And I'm just, again, very fortunate that my methods are much stronger than my theories. I can have all the great theories I want, but they're most likely wrong. The data are telling us what actually is. What motivates you? I feel so fortunate that I get to do this job, a job that I would have paid somebody to let me just do, that I am just stunned every day that somebody pays me a fat salary to do it. I guess I would say maybe all scientists and scholars and intellectuals are like this, so there's nothing unique about what motivates me. I think I'm just interested to make new knowledge, to know something that nobody else had known before. And so in a Star Trek-like way, I will say that probably is the driving force. I can make up stories about this or that motivates me, but really it is to know something that nobody else knew before. Fantastic. And how do you allocate your time? You're asking the worst person about time management. I have no time management. So I don't know. I, I take care of that problem by doing what I want to do, always feeling guilt and, you know, working 85, 90 hours a week. What are some non-consensus views that you hold near and dear? Non-consensus amongst psychologists or non-consensus compared to like what the world believes? Non-consensus to what the world believes. The world believes that A, each of us is basically a good person who's making good decisions. We go wrong every now and then, but we get back on track. And the data show that that's simply not the case that we are wrong, wrong, wrong a lot of the time. And we're often just lucky when we get it right. And that's worth knowing. And most people cannot believe that. The much more, I think, non-consensual view would be that I believe that this happens because we have a false belief that we know our minds. And I would say that we know about a percent of what our brain is doing or what our minds are doing. We don't know the processes by which they're doing their jobs. We can't have access to that in the same way as I don't have access. You know, if I said to you, uh, Sachin, what is your pancreas doing right now? You would be able to easily say to me, I have no clue. I just hope it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. But if I said to you, what are you thinking? What are you feeling? You'll feel like you know what we're doing now. We're talking. And yet, just like in a very fancy computer, so many procedures and processes are compiled because they're used a lot and so on, whose products you don't know about, whose mechanisms you don't know about. 
So I think people like me in my field would say that the hardest, hardest problem for us is how to make people believe that they do not know what their minds are doing. But unlike their bodies, they somehow feel that they do. So they feel they know what their minds are doing, but they actually do not. And I would say that finally, it is that people believe that their behavior is in line with their values. The research shows that very many, in many ways, our intentions are very pure. Our intentions are good. If you asked me to write down my intentions and values, I'm sure they would read like the constitutions of countries, all very high and mighty. But when you observe my behavior, it doesn't seem like those values are being reflected in my choices in who I choose to help. You know, I'll help my friend's children, but I'm not going to help a stranger's child. I don't even know who they are. So all of a sudden, my friend's children can get the benefit of being in my lab in the summer. These are just small examples of the ways in which my values and my behavior are unaligned. And I would say that's something on which we have a very hard time persuading people because they don't see that. What's the biggest trade-off in your professional existence? I feel very strongly that I have not had to make those trade-offs, that this is why I feel I have this incredibly charmed life where the thing that I would have never imagined was likely in my life has not only been likely, but it had, it's turned into this, it's not a job, it's not a career. I think what I do is a calling. When you respond to a calling, you'd rather not be doing anything else but this. So for me, I mean, some people may ask me this question, did you not have children in order to have this career? And I would say, absolutely. I did not have children because I wanted to be able to devote my time to this and not to an individual person. So again, it's not a trade-off because if I'd wanted to have children and didn't, then maybe that would be a trade-off. But it never even struck me that's uh, something I should do. It was so obvious that, yeah, uh, that I'm doing pretty much what I would have in a perfect universe have said, this is what if I could do, I would do. Because frankly, like what could be more interesting than studying the most awesome or organ in the most awesome head, like your own head, like you even understand your own mind better when you do this work. And you think, you know, each of us thinks we are pretty special. And we know that we have in our bodies, this remarkable three pound organ that still is the most sophisticated computer in the known universe. And I get to study it every single day. What are you currently reading? Obviously, lots of work relevant to what I'm doing. I'm going on sabbatical. So for a year, I get to think and read and I don't have to teach or do administration. Or... I'm reading a book called Why Teach by a guy called Mark Edmondson, who's a professor at University of Virginia. And he believes that college education has devolved into a business model where the students are the customers and we have to treat them in the ways their parents and they want to be treated and that college has lost its meaning. People, students aren't there to learn in the old fashioned way and that technology is part of the problem. I'm not sure I agree entirely with what he's saying, but I can see that there is a corporatization of academia and I can't stand that part of it. I mean, I became an academic so I wouldn't have to work for a corporation. And so when universities start to hire more and more middle managers, who do nothing more than sit between us, the faculty, and the students, uh, I get irritated by that. So I'm reading that book. And then I'm reading another book written by my colleague in the history department here. Her name is Jill Lepore, and she's a brilliant historian, and she's written what she calls A Brief History of the U.S. under the title These Truths. What projects are you currently working on? So the language, corpora of languages, and by language I mean data sets that contain uh, words. It could be Google, it could be Twitter, it could be anything. And we're trying to figure out how we can look at those data to see if we can get evidence on a scale that would be much different than even collecting data from millions of people. So you know that the Project Implicit website um, has collected data from, I don't know, 40 million people or something, 40 million tests. We don't know people because we don't know 
uh, sometimes the same person takes many different tests or the same test. So we, we are unusual in that we have had for a long time now very large data sets, which is partly why our work is easily replicable. And when we say something, it holds up. So I'm attracted to these larger data sets. There are always ethical questions. Maybe I'll ask you, what do you think about people pretending to be a certain kind of a person and having the bot say things on Twitter and see what, how people respond and to do it in a proper experiment? Like I gave you the ex- example of a bot that might have a personality and say something. And if that changes people's behavior rapidly, then we know that when a man says, I thought that was sexist, I didn't like that, that that might change people's behavior at least. And who knows, when you change their behavior over time, maybe you change their mind. So who knows about the ethics of doing that, but we're going to think and talk a lot about it in the next few months. How can listeners learn and find out more about your work? So easy. Start to type in the name. (laughs) M-A-H-Z. And by the time you get to the Z, (laughs) your Google autocomplete will (laughs) bring my name up. And once you have that, you'll get videos, papers, websites, everything else that technology now makes possible to share broadly and freely. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. For more information and latest updates, visit us at luminary.fm or follow us on Twitter at luminaryfm. Please subscribe to the podcast, pop us an iTunes review, and share with friends. Don't forget to check out the show notes. And a quick disclaimer, the views and opinions expressed in this episode by the hosts and the participants are solely those in independent capacity and do not in any way represent the views from any organization, company, or management they may be associated with. And thank you for listening.